Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Biome podcast with me, Kate, and I've got Emma and Roby with me, of course. Um, this week we are going to be talking about sustainable seafood, what it is and whether it's possible. So dun, confession dun, dun. time, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> confession time for us is we actually had originally recorded an episode on sustainable f- seafood um, with a, quite a focus on fish farming and sustainability and then like two days later, Sea Spiracy came out, and we were like, "Oh!" And it put a big spanner in the works. <laughs> we kind Maybe of thought we should we, redo this. Yeah, we kind of thought we we can't release an episode talking about this without addressing the documentary and some of the kind of key talking points from the documentary. So we're back. We scrapped it. We're here again. <laughs> um, so we're going to try again and talk about whether sea- sustainable seafood is possible. So just like a very brief introduction, a world without an ocean is, well, a planet Earth without an ocean is kind of like Mars. Um, Our planet would have no life support system without our oceans. And most of the oxygen that we breathe is generated by the oceans and it also absorbs vast quantities of CO2 that we produce. So we really do need our oceans and they are a massive ally for climate change. Because we're talking about seafood and fish, we are actually going to be focusing on the oceans in this episode, but we wanted to really quickly mention freshwater ecosystems because they are always overlooked and we don't want to overlook them. And so we're just going to really briefly mention them, but we are going to be focusing on seafood for the rest of the episode. But just so people are aware, freshwater ecosystems are incredibly um, endangered. They are massively over threat. A third of global populations in these ecosystems are in danger of extinction. Rivers, wetlands and lakes are among the most biodiverse places in the world. Um, They do only cover 1% of the Earth's surface, but they are home to a quarter of all vertebrate species. So incredibly diverse for kind of the space they take up. The WWF recently published a report entitled The World's Forgotten Fishes uh, to highlight freshwater systems and the threats they are facing. So we are going to be focusing on the marine, as I said, but we just wanted to give a bit of a shout out to freshwater because some of these issues do also impact uh, river and lake and wetland environments and the fish there need to be considered too. (laughs) Yeah, people people often forget about freshwater. Like, I don't know why when we talk about seafood, people are like, oh yeah, automatically. I Um, I think it's probably because we, in Britain at least, eat a lot more like sea seafood as opposed mm. to freshwater seafood like if we ate trout and oh my god what else lives in the rivers perch salmon pike perch yeah. and nurch emma <laughs> if we <laughs> ate all these fish as well uh, that was when i made up a fish species yeah. let's just not, <laughs> not go there i think also a lot of the kind of charismatic species we associate with water do live in the ocean like turtles mm. and a sharks. lot of cetaceans and sharks yeah so and coral reefs mm. um so i think we the oceans are maybe a little bit more well known and more sort of prettier um or cuter um but freshwater ecosystems are awesome and so maybe we'll do another podcast all about freshwater just to <laughs> this is the trouble every out. time every time we do a new episode we kind of like poke another tangent which yeah. we then realize oh god we need a whole new podcast on this we are some of the best people ever at creating as much work for ourselves as we oh god yeah. get. <laughs> which is yes. evident because we're re-recording an episode that we've already recorded and, <laughs> and this re-record has now got 16 pages of notes that we are yeah. working from <laughs> so so put the kettle on strap mm. in um, <laughs> yeah i feel like these ones you have to be in it for the long haul like oh, just yeah. be willing to to stick us out till the end sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> so just to kind of give another bit of context introduction emma do you want to go through quickly kind of why our oceans are in trouble yeah i'll do that i think this is a very current topic i mean for those of you who haven't watched seaspiracy this this podcast should still be relevant um but we will be addressing a lot of what happened in the documentary throughout um but just to highlight some of the key threats to our oceans there are lots of them and lots more that i can't cover (laughs) in like a couple minutes um kind of one of the main ones is kind of agricultural runoff and pollutants so coming from intensive agriculture you've also got ghost fishing um which Which, i didn't uh, yeah i hadn't heard of this yeah Yeah, I really it's like just this like term, all though. the old old fishing nets, and I think there's a documentary called Ghost Fleet, 
um, about ghost fishing, which I'd recommend. Um, and then you've all heard of the plastic kind of crisis that we're currently facing, the millions of tons of plastic that are kind of taking up our oceans. Um, and then one which maybe people don't think about is just the fact that we've gotten so efficient at fishing. So we can find even the last of the fish, even if the populations are really small, which is obviously damaging to declining fish populations. And then you've got the problem of bycatch, which Sea Spiracy did bring a lot of attention to. So that's unwanted species like turtles, sharks, other cetaceans, which are caught in the next nets by accident. Um, and then I also think a big one is just our ignorance of mm. the oceans. It's kind of like... I don't know, out of sight, out of mind, I guess, because we are a terrestrial species. A, a lot of what's in the ocean, we kind of... it. The ocean looks the same on the surface. It's still mm -hmm. got waves. It's still going to come onto the shore regardless of whether it's entirely dead or completely healthy. So I think it's quite deceptive um, in in that sense. But, I mean, there are so many others, but I think we're, we're not really going to focus on what the threats are because I think a lot of people know what the problems are. <laughs> um so yeah do we maybe want to talk a little bit maybe about fish farming then because obviously you've got wild caught fish but you've also got fish farms yeah i think f fish farming is kind of one arm of the big debate around sustainable seafood is it better to catch wild fish sustainably or is it better to farm fish um you know completely separate from the natural ecosystem um and, you know, I think the kind of the base mindset that people have is, oh, farming fish is probably better because, you know, we we have this with land animals all the time. You know, we don't go out and shoot wild animals because that's wrong in our heads. We farm them instead. And for some reason, that's right. And this kind of mindset is what we approach the fish kind of situation with. But I don't actually think it's quite as simple as that. So as a kind of industry. Fish farming is also known as aquaculture or pisciculture, which I think is quite a nice name. Um, and it's essentially what it says in the tin. It's the farming of fish. And obviously you need to keep them in water, but you can do it in a lot of different ways. So you could have, um, uh, if you had like a, a water body, like a lake or a river or a, or a sea lock is what, you know, what quite often is used. Or whatever is in the ocean, you can just put a big pen, a big kind of floating net, and you can raise all the fish in there. Um, that's kind of the main one. You also do get them on t in, you know, big t artificial tanks on land, but that is a lot, because it's a lot more energy and a lot more kind of um, maintenance. You don't see that quite so often. And obviously the reason you would raise these farmed fish is for food. Uh, also sometimes for their roe. So caviar is fish eggs, also called roe. And we do, we do farm for that. Some species like sturgeon, um, I think a couple of trout species, rockfish as well, we, we eat the caviar of. And what's interesting is that, you know, beef historically in the kind of environmental debate gets a lot of attention. And there are a lot of cows in the world, but the world now produces more farmed fish than beef, which I think is wow. quite interesting. And it's that thought that 3.3 billion people around the world rely on fish as their main source of protein. Wow. I think I guess when you think about it with um, with beef, like if you can have these farms with loads and loads of individuals in the same place, mm. you you could never kind of get that with cows just because they occupy more more space. Yeah, um, this is the thing. A fish is a lot smaller than a cow, and <laughs> actually, what is actually quite interesting is that because you know marine stocks have 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 been negatively impacted by wild fishing to such a large extent almost half of all consumed seafood now world over comes from fish farming from aquaculture and now we might find that quite surprising because in britain we do still tend to to, to favor uh, wild caught fish um but we are one tiny subset of of the global picture and actually globally nearly half is, is is farmed and the big producer of this is asia so 90 percent of the world's big fish farms are in asia china alone produces 55 million tons of seafood using agriculture uh aquaculture wow. sorry not agriculture that would be water, <laughs> water farming is water farming thing i don't know yeah. um so yeah we just touching on the surface of this without even analyzing its sustainability this is a huge industry and yeah it's going to be having some huge impacts but i think it's also quite important to know how does it differ from wild caught fishing 
aside, aside from you know just keeping them in captivity like what are the different effects on the ecosystem i think yeah it's sometimes i guess quite hard to distinguish the two so say if you've got um those seafood like those pens in the natural environment it's very much blurring the lines between Mm. is that in their natural environment or not but it tends to be that wild caught seafood is it's just naturally wild that's where it's living and then you come in with um nets or various other fishing techniques which we'll talk about and you'll just harvest them from their natural environment so they're not enclosed um and I guess a key point just genetically is that wild fish are very well adapted to their environments and so they'll have selective pressures in the wild that kind of make them fitter or better adapted or able to migrate upstream. Um, so say for the case with um, with salmon, which is something I didn't realise. So actually where you have bigger rivers and bigger waterfalls and stronger currents, you'll actually have bigger fish. Whereas in, it could be very close by, smaller rivers with um less strong currents and things like that you'll have smaller fish and that's entirely a re- result of how they're adapted um which is obviously something that you're not going to get in a farmed environment mm. because it's very contained um and then i guess in the wild you have fish that are eating their natural diet we're going to talk about this um when we talk about farm fish is it's like what are you actually feeding them um it's very kind of artificial and use of kind of colorings and things like that and in the wild um they're less likely to be exposed to antibiotics pesticides coloring colorings and harmful substances i mean you do have kind of metals and mercury and those other toxins that you get in the ocean Mm. um but that's kind of what you'd find there anyway so i guess it's what you'd think of when we're talking about wild fish it's your fish in the ocean swimming about doing their thing um and then we come in and take them. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of an overview of what the two different methods of kind of harvesting fish are. Do we want to talk through some of the, the pros and cons? Maybe we start with fish farming. So so mm. like, what are some of the pros to, to, to fish farming? Well, the kind of biggest um, argument people use in favor of fish farming is that it farm raised fish means that less wild fish are being caught. Um, so if we're meeting the demand through farming, then we're going to be taking less out of the ocean. Wild caught fishing methods harvest kind of large amount of species that aren't designed to be caught. As Emma mentioned, bycatch is a big threat to um, marine ecosystems. And so the kind of idea that farming could limit wild fishing is sort of the biggest argument people use in support of fish farming. And this is predominantly true for kind of land-based fish farms or when the wild species is not really being harvested at all because the whole demand is being met through the supply of farmed fish. Another kind of pro of fish farming is that fish farms can easily be built into kind of urban or suburban areas. And so these aquacultures can actually be used, built in unused spaces or even in cities. So there's kind of less strain on the natural environment that way. And a kind of really key point when you're talking about fish farming is it's actually much more efficient than livestock farming. Um, it takes roughly a pound of feed to produce a pound of fish. So it's pretty much one for one. Wow. It takes, okay. yeah. Um, but it takes two pounds of feed to produce a pound of chicken, seven pounds of feed to produce a pound of cattle. So in terms of efficiency of resources, it's a lot kind of better to be farming fish than to be farming other livestock because that seems like a huge wastage as well of the amount yeah. of feed that you're being used to make one animal in terms of mm. like the pound of cattle that's yeah, yeah significantly more than you'd need for fish when you could just yeah. cut out the middleman quite easily exactly and and fish are a kind of source of protein um so it's and a very important protein source that can kind of meet the demand the needs of these nine billion people roaming around um with the kind of least demand on the earth's resources in terms of feed so that's kind of another big argument people use in favor of fish farming but in the interest of balance um <laughs> let's hear cons, <laughs> the we love a balanced fish farming. <laughs> is fish farming sustainable interestingly a kind of another big a, a, well a big con for fish farming is its effect on wild fish so as much as that is considered a pro there's also an impact which is a negative 
So it is hard to talk about the kind of impacts of fish farming as a whole because it does obviously depend on your method of farming but in these kind of pens that are in the ocean there can be quite significant effects on the surrounding environment. So sea lice for example are killing kind of small wild fish. So in places like Norway and Scotland where they have these large pens of farmed fish out in the ocean fish diseases and fish waste can just spread into the water and affect the wild populations. We also have this problem of escaping fish. So there are more fish escaping from Norwegian fish farms than all the Norwegian wild salmon rivers actually produce. And these fish... But how is, the that, farm... a, how is that a bad thing? Because surely escaping fish would just increase the wild population, no? Well, the problem is, is that these farmed fish then breed with the wild fish and they actually erode the competitive DNA of wild fish. So they're kind of oh. interfering with natural selection which is kind of problematic. It would be like releasing zoo animals mm. and just expecting everything to be okay. And so reversing this natural selection makes fish less adapted to their environment and therefore less likely to survive, reduces the fitness of the population overall as well. Also, a problem with escaping fish is that they might not be native in the area they end up escaping in. Um, mm. So there was a case where loads of Atlantic salmon escaped from a fish farm into the Pacific which resulted in over 300,000 non-native individuals Hmm. in the kind of local ecosystem. And that's obviously incredibly problematic for the native ecosystem. And fish, catching 300,000 fish is not going to be easy, selectively catching to remove. Um, So that's a problem. They also then obviously compete with wild fish, whether they're native or non-native, and they can bring in parasites, diseases, and disease outbreaks in these fish farms have been documented all over the world. So again, that's a very well-documented problem. And some argue that a more controlled environment by having fish in tanks on land is a better alternative because it has less impact on the oceans. But many aquacultures damage the environments by contaminating wild ecosystems with pollution and other kind of poor farming practices including things like agricultural runoff as we mentioned before and they often use unsustainable fish feed which is actually made from wild caught fish hang on Um, a minute that doesn't sound right (laughs) yeah this is this is so weird to me and i really don't understand it but they feed the fish on feed that's made from wild fish Hmm. and this Therefore, the fish farming industry is contributing to overfishing in the same... Yeah. And the kind of same environmental strain caused by industrial fishing is therefore contributing to the fish farming industry. And it also... That firstly undermines the idea that you're going to leave wild populations alone because of fish farming. But it also makes the whole idea of it being efficient in terms of feed a little bit... Completely Icky. bonkers. Yeah, <laughs> because, yeah, because like. the whole point was like keeping the two separate in terms of yeah. you know, taking so, from wild fish populations. But but and it's great that one pound of feed makes one pound of fish compared to cattle and chickens. That's great. But if that one pound of feed is means one pound of wild Other fish, fish <laughs> then you're killing two lots of fish to feed one lot of fish. It doesn't really add up as nicely as it did. Mm. Um, so the impacts on wild populations are kind of as heavily felt if not more than the benefits to wild populations so there's that Um, and I I guess the other thing to think about is the energy side of it like it Mm -hmm. obviously so you know okay the ideal fish farm would be on land not in the water and you know completely self-contained but you know fish don't just live in you can't just have a bucket of water with some fish in it's got to be cleaned it's got to be purified it's got to be kept the right temperature with the right kind of acidity and stuff and all of that takes energy and you need some bit, and you know, fish poo. You need big, big water treatment systems, um, <clears throat> all of which are powered by energy. And so, if that doesn't come from sustainable and renewable energy sources, then actually, all you're doing is essentially just chucking another big coal power plant on land, even though it's a fish farm. Um, and you know, you can quite easily imagine how this fish farm would actually need more power than quite a few fossil mm. fuel kind of industries. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I've got something in my throat there. Um, and waste is quite an interesting one. This argument is... This this kind of con to fish farming is interesting. I'm not fully convinced on it, but obviously fish produce waste. And if they're all in one place, that waste just goes to the bottom. Um, it's not spread out over the whole you know, fish's environment. 
Um, and this waste is, you know, quite harmful as, as what you know most excrement is, high levels of ammonia and things. And so there's what there's a fish farm in Norway which is said to produce as much waste as the whole of Oslo over a single year. And because it's a shallow water pen, it just falls to the bottom and sinks there. And again, if you have them on land, then that's great, and all that solid waste presumably will go to landfill because I don't think you can re, you know treat it or anything. Um, you've also got water, so a fish farm on land will use a lot of water because some will always be lost to evaporation and things. So energy intensivity and waste are two kind of other aspects to fish farming to think about. I'm not entirely sure of the waste one, just because fish... I mean, I do understand it. Fish, obviously, everywhere excrete. And, you know, that's the reason the sea smells salty. It's not actually the salt, it's fish and whale poo. Um, and I guess concentrating that all in one place would be bad. Although I'd I imagine the currents would like come the, in. it's more like the shallow, those shallow water mm. pens, like in inland, not inland, what am I trying to say? You know, the, the bits where you've got the locks, like yeah. sea locks or things like that, where they often have those salmon pens. Mm. Um, that's very different to having the kind of open water ones where you do have the currents, you do have the water moving away mm. because it's very still and it's in a sheltered bay. Mm. Mm. It literally accumulates like this layer of sludge like that thick. And then anything on the sea floor is kind of just drowned in fish poo. Mm, um, that's true. But I don't think it, I don't think it applies to all of them. Like it's just, it's, yeah. But there is an ethical impact as well, isn't there, on fish? As there always is with agriculture, you also do have to. And you know, we 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 don't like it when we talk about fish. We you know, cows mm. are cute. You shouldn't kill cows. But fish, we kind of just think, oh, they're just fish. But there is yeah, still an e ethical impact. People often think fish aren't sentient. Um, mm. But there's you know there's a lot of evidence now that they are and that they do feel pain. And even more so than other vertebrates now, research is coming out because they have to have those abilities to detect sort of rapid movements within a group to escape predation or move together as one. They it's been proven they've got these other kind of lateral lines and things that we that we don't even have. And so wow. it's like I think it's a bit strange how we view fish as so different to all the rest of the other vertebrates, yet I think there's still a massive ethical consideration especially if we are farming them because in these pens often you have them that are really really densely stocked so loads and loads of fish in a small space and in order to keep them relatively healthy i guess is <laughs> the only way i can put it is they need to use a lot of antibiotics a lot of kind of pesticides growth hormones and actually even colorings i didn't realize this but so farmed salmon naturally would be grey if you just left it and didn't do anything to it. So wild kind of Atlantic salmon, it's this deep um, kind of pinkish, reddish colour, but the farm salmon would be grey. So they have to add all these colourings to actually get it to look like smoked salmon. Oh um, god, that's really annoying because I love smoked salmon. <laughs> <laughs> I know it kind of... though that it would taste exactly the same, but people wouldn't buy it. Yeah. Mm. But that's yeah, no, that's so true. <laughs> We're such a weird species. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's quite an interesting point, you know. All this this talk about like fish intellig uh, intelligence and you know the ethics of fish. I think it, you know, is you know, we have been separated from fish for over three hundred million years. So evidently, they you know, there's no way they can be like sentient in in a human or even a primate kind of way of conceiving of it because even you know we're still struggling to talk to chimpanzees and they're teeny teeny bit away from us but i think mm -hmm. it is also you know it, we do still need to remember that we've all been here it's you know four billion years planet earth we're all still here at the same point so clearly they've had just the same amount of time to get in as advanced and as advanced and as advanced as as we have just in a different way um yeah but i think even now with um i don't know if you go i think we were talking about it before but that documentary my octopus teacher mm. um it's kind of even that idea of invertebrates we kind of always had that perception that they're inferior they don't feel anything they can't have complex kind of lifestyles and then you watch that and you're like oh my goodness it's you you see this intelligent deceptive creature and you're like that's an invertebrate it shouldn't be able to do that i mean in your heads that's wired to society what we think of invertebrates so 
I, I reserve the right to say that I have always thought octopuses were intelligent and I've always thought that the apocalypse will come on <laughs> eight tentacles and I have been ready and prepared. Um, and kind of, I don't know, coming back to this kind of weird perception thing that is slightly skewed about a fish <laughs> and the other one which I think does kind of link into fish farms is this whole omega-3 thing. Um, there is definitely a perception in our culture, at least, that we need to eat fish because that's the only natural source of omega-3. And, you know, oily fish like mackerel and stuff, it's all good for you because it's got lots of omega-3 in it. Um, mm. But it's its not actually the fish that are the source of the omega-3 in the same way that a chicken isn't actually the source of the protein that's in the chicken. So omega-3 wow. is actually made by algae. And as the little fish eat oh. the algae... yeah. As the little fish eat the algae and then the big fish eat the little fish and then we eat the big fish, we get the omega-3 mm. oils. It's a classic trophic yeah. cascade, you know? I mean, um, I guess it, it does build up, but mm. I guess it's that, yeah, even like when, from when I was little, doctors saying, yeah, the only way you can get omega-3 is through ma- ma- mackerel and things like that. And since I've gone plant-based, I take algal omega-3 supplements mm. and it's like, Okay, well, th- then I, that's when I realised, I think, that, okay, well, it actually comes... Where do the fish get it? They get it from the algae, so why can't we get it from there too? Yeah, I mean, I think if you still ate a mackerel, you'd still get a load of omega-3 from it, because it is, mm. you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, bi- yeah. it's bioaccumulation. They do have a lot of omega-3 in it, but I think it is important to realise that they didn't make it. They just kind of yeah. ate it <laughs> in the same way that we would be eating them. I just um, love the, pa- the power of plants. Just always- <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, so kind of, it, it's sounding a bit bleak, um, fish farming. Do we think fish farming yes. can be sustainable? And if so, how, what is, what does sustainable fish farming look like? Possibly, if it exists. I think it can be sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. I don't Tell think it's <laughs> widespread enough. And I, do, I don't think the fish farming that we're talking about is, is the way to do it sustainably. So I right, think... okay. Yeah, the kind of the two things that spring to mind are aquaponics and polyculture. So they're they're slightly different. So aquaponics is a combination of hydroponics and aquaculture. So it integrates the production of terrestrial plants with the production of aquatic fish in a kind of closed loop system which mimics nature. So the kind of idea behind aquaponics is you've got these fish in tanks on land. Um, They produce a load of nutrient-rich wastewater This is then filtered by a solid removal unit, passed through a biofilter, which turns the toxic ammonia into nutritious nitrate via this really cool reverse nitrate reaction. You've got a layer of plants living on top of the fish tank, so they're kind of either floating or suspended. The plants absorb the nutrients, purify the water, which is then recycled back into the fish tanks. The plants also absorb the CO2 produced by the fish and the water in the fish tanks absorbs the heat and helps maintain the greenhouse temperature. So it's this really nice, um, entirely closed system mimicking the natural environment, um, which you could use on quite a large scale if you actually put some time and thought into it. And there are a couple of really key advantages that this aquaponics system has over current fish farming. Um, so for the first, you know, the first of first of all is water treatment costs are much lower because the, all the waste is being recycled within the system and it's not mm. released into nature. Um, you can get essentially get two products from one system, so you can harvest the fish. You can also harvest the plants. Um, you could also integrate algae into the system, harvest the algae for omega three. You could integrate shellfish into the system, even greater, you know, water purifiers. You could have an, essentially a, a tiny, tiny ocean on land, and that's the kind of the gist of aquaponics. And the other one, that... so I, I think aquaponics is a really cool way to go. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I like no, the I idea would agree because it's that. Yeah. No, go ahead, okay. <laughs> I was. I think we're about to say the same thing. Um, yeah I really like that I like the idea of a of a closed system and kind of mimicking nature I think um I'm biased as a conservationist but I think (laughs) that we can never do anything as well as nature does look we can well we can never look after nature as well as it looks after itself we have Mm. a responsibility to but if we can find these kind of nature-based solutions they are they were amazing um but it sounds quite futuristic to me almost yeah I mean these 
creating a mini ocean and do you know it was like it it was designed by well it was kind of first thought up seriously by nasa who were looking into a way to produce food in space with no soil so how do you get the biomass up there Oh, you wow. use water, yeah, which is so we can have space stations <laughs> with like aquaponics. Systems. Anyway, it's crazy. Oh, the I other one, my, my brain can't cope with that. <laughs> <laughs> the other one, and you know, aquaponic systems do exist, very small scale, but they do exist. But the other kind of method of sustainable fish farming is polyculture, which exists on a much bigger scale, as I understand it, at the minute, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's something that actually dates back thousands and thousands of years. So like you were saying, Kate, it does sound quite futuristic, but it's something that, especially Chinese farmers, they kind of developed, kind of, I guess, similar to the aquaponics, aquaculture side of things. But in a polyculture, you have lots of different species involved in the system. Um, So in this Chinese system, you had this polyculture of carp, pigs, ducks, vegetables. um, Merch. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, shut up. (laughs) And um, so basically what they did was they kind of used the manure from the ducks and the pigs to fertilise the pond algae, which was then grazed by the carp, which is a type of fish, which is not a made-up species because (laughs) I have a tendency of doing that. Um, And so then they actually added these carp, which are these omnivorous fish, to rice paddies. So what they did was they actually kept insect pests at bay and then you could harvest the rice as a crop, but then you could also take the the carp as well, which was used as part of the diet. So that kind of carp paddy polyculture is actually what shapes the Chinese fish and rice diet, kind of the staples hmm. of that diet. So it dates back quite far. Wow. Um, yeah. And then another one, which I really like, this is <laughs> kind of my best my best polyculture example <laughs> is is this guy who is in a fjord in british columbia which i As bet you is do. pretty amazing yeah um, and so he kind of took these ideas from this ancient chinese method and so what he has he's got cod in pens and then down current he has baskets of these native cockles oysters scallops and mussels so these are kind of these this bivalve group which they're really, really good. I think, like you mentioned, Roby, at kind of filtering the fine kind of debris and excretions out of the water. So really, really, really important in water filtering. And then you've also got sugar kelp, which is growing, um, which can be used in soap and sushi. And you can also use it to produce bioethanol. So I think you're getting the picture that all these things can be used to produce a lot of various other things that, then can, that can then be harvested and generate a profit. Um and then, like you were mentioning in the aquaponics kind of system, what, what, what are we, is it aquaculture or aquaponics? I I'm... think aquaculture is fish farming, aquaponics is fish farming plus plants, polyculture is fish farming plus plants plus animals, I think. Okay. I All mean, right. the, the, lines, the lines blur a little. Um, mm. it's a, it's yeah. The concept is very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so like with the aquaponic system that you were talking about, Roby, um, this guy also then has um, various aquatic plants that then convert the remaining nitrates into plant tissue and can be used to make the plants grow. And then what I love is that even beyond that, so on the sea, uh, on the on the floor of this this fjord, I guess, um, he's got sea cucumbers, <laughs> um, <laughs> which take up the heavier kind of organic waste that all the other species have missed. So. The entire That's such system. a new solution. I know. Sea cucumbers bring in, will save bring the, in world. the sea cucumbers. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> so it's this giant water filtering system, and you've got extra food, extra profit. So I like the sound of that. Um, <laughs> but there's another really cool one, isn't there, Roby? Um, in well, it's India. funny. It's funny you should say that because I'm actually not going to talk about it because I don't actually think it's relevant. Like I put it in there. <laughs> okay. I, I put it in there because I was like, I've been there. I know what it looks like. But actually, it's just <laughs> it's just normal fish farming, like cool these okay. breeds um and I, I guess i guess this is kind of hammering a nail into the coffin of traditional you know salmon in a pen off the coast fish farming style aquaculture but the, there as i understand it there is at least one method where that could be modified to make it potentially more sustainable isn't there yeah i mean this is something i think we looked into post sea spiracy um, because obviously if you watch it, they come out with the the statement that there's no such thing as sustainable fishing. And this is an example where 
some people might disagree, but I think this is kind of, they're doing as much as they can to make it as sustainable as possible given the state of the ocean. Um, so it's a company called Omega Blue and they're an offshore fish farm. So what this means is they're, they've got these fish in these deep water pens. So mm. rather than being in shallow water with no currents, you've got the water currents that are continuously kind of flushing out the, the tanks of these fish. And because they're basically in the natural environment, so to speak, so they're in the ocean, they're not removed from it, this reduces the need to kind of treat fish with antibiotics or to give them other growth hormones and things like that. Um, And they're not as crowded either, so there's less of an ethical dilemma there. Um, And they do this cool kind of cage rotation system as well as kind of regular fallowing. So they leave Mm. some of the pens empty, which I guess washes out any potential diseases or, or waste accumulation. And so why I see this as relatively sustainable is because they took, it was only 100 fish that they actually took from the wild initially. And then they kind of rear them in these, on these pens, I think on land, kind of as a sort of hatchery system um and then from those 100 wild fish they've been able to produce 500,000 oh my god um so if you think about that that's 500,000 fish that they would have had to have taken from the wild if they didn't have this this offshore pen system um and also we came we talked about the argument of fish feed as well it's like what are they actually feeding them so they're using MSC certified sardines. We'll talk about MSC <laughs> in a little bit. Um, but they're now also aiming to use just the trimmings. So anything that would have been thrown away. So oh, if you're okay. using MSC certified, something that would have been thrown away, in my mind, it's like, yes, you're still using wild fish, but that's kind of as, as good as mm. it gets, I think. So, you know, I think... Basically, the jury's still out on fish farming, I think. There's a lot of there's a lot of bad, but there's also a lot of options where people are trying to do a lot of good. So should we tackle perhaps, you know, the remaining elephant in the room, <laughs> which is fishing. How can fishing can fishing be sustainable? Is it sustainable? What do we think, guys? <laughs> yeah, so just like a quick kind of side note of what we mean when we talk about fishing and fishing as a term encompasses a lot of different methods from you know guy with his rod or girl with her rod um to kind of super trawlers um Mm. and you've got kind of bean trawling purse nets saying nets trawling um big boats little boats it's it's a whole industry (laughs) built up around this um (laughs) sorry um (laughs) but something we want to make sure that we really highlight because it wasn't made clear enough i don't feel in sea spiracy is there is a monumental difference between subsistence fishing and kind of commercial slash industrial fishing absolutely subsistence fishing means you know you are catching the food that you eat and no more than that and you are very reliant on that as your food source and subsistence fishing on the whole is sustainable um because one person is not going to have a huge impact on the ocean um obviously you know there can be issues with subsistence harvesting um in terms of ecological impact as there is with any kind of human interaction interference with wild ecosystems but in nearly all circumstances it is sustainable and industrial harvesting occurs on such a large scale Mm. and with so much more profound impact that is it's really it's just completely not okay to lump subsistence fishing in with kind of the impacts of fishing Um, because also i think one thing to mention with subsistence fishing is it tends to be almost on the day like the fishermen will go out in the morning Mm. that they need the fish they'll catch what they need for that day and eat what they need i think with commercial fishing there's so much waste as well yeah um which isn't used and we don't need to harvest at that scale so i think the scale is the problem Mm. as with so many things with humans yeah (laughs) and and it's target fishing you know you're not going to have bycatch on really with subsistence fishing so it kind of is fishing currently sustainable um no (laughs) (laughs) okay cool Um, we can end it here (laughs) (laughs) you know i i came away from you know sea spiracy with quite a few um you know comments and you know, five, two stars and a wish or whatever you, whatever we did in primary school with, you know, what they said. What I thought was really interesting 
is the link that they made between sustainable fishing and kind of neo-colonialism in uh, it was really well illustrated with the big eu fishing fleets coming down to the coast of west africa um and completely depleting the fish stocks there to the detriment of the of the people who live in those countries who can't feed themselves and then they had a really nice link where they said okay well now because they can't feed themselves they're turning to bush meat which has a direct link on global health as we know, and also on terrestrial-based conservation. So I I did like that link that that film made between West Africa, well, in particular, West African neocolonialism, and the fact that actually, it's it can't this industry can't be sustainable, even if it was you know even if it wasn't depleting the fish, it still wouldn't be sustainable because of that neocolonialist aspect, because of the knock-on effect on global health and the knock-on effect on, on you know, terrestrial ecosystems. So that was just the kind of the point that I wanted to make with that. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting and worthwhile point to make. In terms of kind of this argument that fishing is not sustainable, um, just to give you some kind of stats on why people think that, the UN Food and Agricultural Organization estimates that about 70% of the world's fisheries are fully exploited. Many wow. species are already depleted, um, and by 2003, a third had collapsed. The world's fisheries have declined by a half to a whole trophic level over the past 50 years. So, wow, species. That's shocking. Uh, yeah. And species at the top of the food ca- chain are being exploited first. An over-exploitation of these high trophic levels causes their stocks to collapse and then they are replaced by species at lower trophic levels. It's called mesopredator release. And if this trend keeps going, we're just going to end up eating jellyfish, essentially. Um, <laughs> Yay for jellyfish! Keep, if we keep losing these higher trophic levels, not only is their mass ecosystem collapsed because you really need apex predators for a lot of these ecosystems to function, but we're also losing these species that we rely on mm. for food. Or rely on in inverted commas cod fisheries are kind of gradually being replaced by fishery for snow crab and northern shrimp because the stocks of cod have crashed so much as a result of these kind of like more efficient fishing techniques and better technology and as fishing becomes more efficient we're just depleting fish more and more um so i think the- that's quite significant like that's mm. several trophic levels down mm. if you're going from shrimp up to cod like there are several that's really quite a a decrease in in trophic levels that they're having to fish at and cod is such a kind of classic fish to eat um so the you know your fish and chips Mm. in britain you know big thing we all love it and cod is you know often the kind of fish of choice for fish and chips and so the idea that that's their cod is going to be completely depleted is quite just a bit you know mind-boggling alarming yeah yeah (laughs) The, um, it's in it's in bird's eye fish fingers and yeah exactly. it's everything it's such, it's such a common food species um but it's but it's, it's interesting very that common. you bring up cod because it's that's yeah and and what's interesting about that is it's a classic example of shifting baseline syndrome because we didn't used to eat cod we used to eat herring and sardines and mackerel much more than we ever ate cod and then when those fisheries collapsed in the north sea we shifted to antarctic cod so we all, we already know what what happens here. We've done it once before, mm. and we just shifted, and now we're shifting again to West Africa. And this whole kind of offsetting of the problem to other people in other places is is a key reason of why this isn't sustainable. I think. And obviously, as I mentioned, there are various different methods of fishing, and some are more destructive than others. Bottom trawling is particularly disruptive, um, and it destroys not only not only does it kind of catch in these massive nets loads and loads of species and loads and loads of fish but it also literally destroys habitats and the kind of bottom of the seafloor is just getting eroded and you know many of non-target species bycatch are caught in these nets as well i mean i think again it's the scale of these nets it's yeah. some of those bottom trawlers they're weighted and they could fit seven jumbo jets inside them so whether mm. you di- intend to be caught in this net or not i feel like you have very little control as a mm. fish you're in the be ocean in because you're, you're gonna be caught in it <laughs> exactly um so that's just kind of ma- maddening to think that you could just wipe out that amount of, of space and when you hear stuff like this it is really hard to think that commercial or industrial fishing could ever be sustainable mm. um especially i mean bottom trawling 
I don't think can ever be no. classed as sustainable. Um, but when you're hearing the damage that's already been done, we almost have to reverse it to get mm. back to a, to a sustainable level because the sustainable level that we need to be at now is going to be so much lower than what it could have been if we'd started out that way. Yeah, started early and done it right. Mm. So yeah. what do you guys think? Are there some kind of answers to this in terms of shifting towards something more sustainable? Mm. I, I think there are methods which, if implemented, could make industrial fishing more sustainable. I don't know if I would go so far as to say it would make it sustainable, but I think it would make right. it more sustainable. And therefore, I think it's definitely worth doing anyway, if only yeah. as a, a springboard to, you know, more... I don't want to say radical, but more um, comprehensive solutions. So I think the, the big one that pops to mind is government subsidies. Um, government subsidies are actively, you know, having a having a active negative impact on the ocean because they're keeping fishing boats fishing even when there are too few fish left for fishing to be profitable on its own. So I, th I and I haven't independently verified this, but the stat that Seaspiracy came out with is that total government subsidies to the fishing industry worldwide is around 30 billion a year and that's you know it's not sustainable because there simply aren't enough fish yeah. to justify mm. you know giving all that money in otherwise it, you know the whole the whole idea of a subsidy is just is, is just ghastly um and so they have to be stopped and i think that would because stopping those subsidies would decrease the size of the fishing industry that would have a positive effect on on, on global fish stocks. There will be pushback from that if that was ever taken. Um, fishermen who make their li largely make their livelihoods from subsidies would be very angry about that. There are kind of two responses to this. You know, we have to adapt to the times for the welfare of our species and our planet. Times have always changed and they will always continue to do so, as will industries. There are less musket manufacturers and swordsmiths and tapestry makers than there were... 400 years ago, and we will always continue to change. On the, on the flip side of that coin is everyone has a right to work and a right to provide for themselves and their families. And so if and when we do force change and reform on the fishing industry, I think our absolute priority, joint highest with how can we make it more sustainable, is actually how can we make sure that fishermen and fishing communities are the first to benefit from these changes? How can we ensure that we actually bring these people with us? Because if you just leave them behind, well, you're just creating another humanitarian problem further down the yeah. line. Yeah, I have a lot of empathy for that because I, I don't think that the answer is to end all fishing forever because yeah. you would be just leaving so many people abandoned. Mm. You, can't just, you can't just do that. Um, and I, I think that it is very possible to not need to do that. Mm. Um, but it, it the kind of there needs to be this kind of discussion about sustainability more prevalent you know and involving the fishing industry in these discussions because at the end of the day if we continue on the scale we are we are going to run out of fish mm. and then the industry will collapse and those people will be left with nothing yeah if the regardless industry adapts, of whether we did yeah. it or not yeah. <laughs> so the kind of there's no way out of this what, the the only way out of it where all the fish are in all the people working in the fishing industry don't just lose their jobs is if we make it more sustainable because if it doesn't become more sustainable it will eventually they will lose exist. their jobs but yeah they will also yeah. i think is a point to make is maybe there needs to be alternatives before we just go for a let's boycott fishing mm. completely mm. Oh, like 100%. i think i mentioned this before but with the gorillas um kind of the, the local people in the area were vastly expanding agricultural land and cutting down the forest because that's what they saw as the only way to sustain themselves and their families and to keep their livelihoods going. But as soon as they were offered alternatives, like in the ecotourism industry with jobs as kind of rangers and anti-poaching units, like that gave them more of an incentive to, to switch from something that was unsustainable to sustainable, but you need that in place first. I don't think you can just go in and say, oh, sorry, fish isn't a good idea. You need to stop. Mm -hmm. Like, there needs to be something in place first. Yeah, I yeah, mean... I agree. This is a really complex issue, and it therefore almost, by definition, requires a complex solution, which I don't think was represented that clearly in, in this recent documentary that came out. Um, the other yeah. kind of method that springs to mind of how you could reform the fishing industry... 
to make it more sustainable. Again, not blanket sustainable, but a step towards sustainability would be quotas. So uh, these are in place at the moment, but obviously a quota, there's kind of two types of quota. There's a fixed effort quota, which limits the number of individuals that allow, are allowed to fish by issuing only a certain number of licenses or limiting the time that people can fish for. And then there's a fixed quantity quota, which is limiting the number of fish that are to be harvested. And so you, there's a lot of debate in the fisheries science industry about which, which is a better way to go. Um, I, prob I would imagine that fixed effort is probably better just because it's a lot harder to rig so fixed quantity quotas, mm -hmm. there have been instances, I know there was one in, in Orkney, I think, where the scales were literally rigged so that they consistently underreported the amount of fish that were, that were caught. So, you know, quotas, yeah. quotas that go off biology and demographic plasticity analysis have some potential. And they mm. are, but the thing is, they are used already, and evidently there is still a problem. But I think so. they've been sh shown to be so flawed, particularly with whaling, mm. um, because those analyses, those graphs, they kind of rely on certain demographics being a blanket term for all marine species. And it turned out with um, with whales in particular that the sort of the maximum carrying capacity i can't the maximum sustainable yield i think it was mm. was not at half the point that they kind of expected to be it was a skewed curve and so they were actually massively over harvesting the whole time even though you had this quota because mm. they thought that that would be the sustainable point but not right. all species are the same whereas i think yeah. fixed effort so that would be an example of a fixed quantity quota. I think fixed effort does somewhat avoid that. I don't think quotas will save us, and I don't think they are the solution. I think they have the potential to be part of the solution. Um, yeah. I think I think a much better option would be no-take MPAs, which yeah. we're now going to talk about, I think. We should definitely talk about no-take MPAs. They're really important. Yeah, I love a no-take MPA. Um, <laughs> Kate loves a no-take MPA. <laughs> I just, I do think they're brilliant. Um, so an MPA is a marine protected area. And just a quick explanation of what a marine protected area is, is it is an area of the ocean um, that has some level of protection over it. And a really key difference to like a fish farm or anything else is it's not fenced or penned in any way. It is an area of ocean that is completely wild it's not like a game a national park that's got a fence around it it is species are free to move in and out but it is an area that is awarded some level of protection now the amount of protection on mpas does vary and in seaspiracy they kind of spoke about an mpa where the only thing the only regulation in that area was that you weren't allowed to kayak um but you were still allowed i to feel fish. like that's massively blanketing mpas though. massively <laughs> massively they missed out so much because I think it, it kind of seems counterintuitive that you can have MPAs that allow fishing, but some do. Then you have no-take MPAs, which means there's no fishing. And in a no-take MPA, this kind of creates a safe space for fish populations to recover. And the idea is that they will recover in this space and then spill out into take areas or outside of the MPA to replenish fish populations outside. So they're kind of designed with a kind of ecological environmental idea in mind they are designed to protect ecological communities but they they do actually there's so much evidence that they benefit fisheries because they allow the persistence of species targeted by fisheries because while fisheries are under intense pressure and the size of fish catches have kind of leveled off or declined despite an over increasing ever increasing fishing effort which is not surprising because the more you fish the more you're catching, the less fish you're getting, as we've seen. There's been these de declines in fish. So, some kind of fishing industries, um, industry types, um, remain sceptical that this spillover will kind of offset the loss of fishing from like losing the fishing ground. So the role of kind of no-take MPAs remains quite contentious. Um, Which I don't think it should, you know. Yeah. You know what? I'm you know what? I'm actually going to express a firm opinion. I'm all behind no take MPAs and I think they are really really good and I don't think criticism criticism of them is rooted in fact. 
Because I, I think people do don't I. realize how quickly fish stocks can recover mm. oh if gosh, left yes. alone. That's a massive benefit for the outside areas because they will be able to fish and the populations will be healthy again. Yeah, this is a really key point about fish is they are remarkably fecund and that means that they have a high ability to reproduce and that's because they lay eggs and they lay loads and loads and loads of eggs and these eggs get you know washed around and so it's really hard on one is hand that the to try term for it? <laughs> yes, yes i'm a biologist but you know um, emma we just had they, that they, they went move. from 100 to 50 500 000, right that stat yeah. from earlier like yeah it's incredible and they move. So if you lay all your eggs in the MPA, they're not all going to hatch in the MPA. They mm. will be washed around. And um, <laughs> so it's really hard to drive fish to extinction because they are so fecund. But it's also, you know, it, they don't need as long to recover. It's not like a rhino where the gestation period is, they're pregnant for 16 months. So they, you know, and then they keep their babies for three years. So you're kind of looking at a four year gap. Fish thousands all the time <laughs> fish, fish go for a you know a quantity over quality yes they do strategy. because obviously not every single egg survives yeah. and becomes an adult but they have the likelihood is increased and that's that's how it works with fish i really think no take mpas are really valuable because i like the idea that there are areas that are left pris- pristine and mm. left alone but that we're not saying that we're not going to do that to the whole ocean and we're allowing that to spill out and go into these areas where fishing would be allowed because it means that not only are the fish given this safe space, but the kind of, if you're looking at a coral reef system, the whole reef system, the plants, everything living there is being completely untouched. And I just think that's really valuable. So I do think they should be considered a part of the solution. But again, I don't think on their own they should necessarily be the whole solution they can definitely help and i think they should be implemented on a global scale but this kind of needs to be combined with reform in the fishing industry because if you've got a little patch that's protected mm. but then everything around it is being trawled up it's it's not going to allow species to recover enough and also you know just on an economic point if you've got that little patch and trawlers mm. all around it you're never actually going to produce enough fish for each trawler to meet its needs Exactly. Like you need you need fishing reform as well as well as yeah. the MPAs to kind of okay maybe it's only exactly. three trawlers at once or you know something like that yeah but a great thing about MPAs and you know you can have in table uh, in table mount in um, <laughs> in Cape Town MPAs there's a, table an MPA well it's called the Table Mountain <laughs> Marine Protected Area because it goes around the peninsula that Table Mountain's on um, and it's zoned not the whole the MPA is huge and not every aspect of the MPA is no take. Certain areas are no take. But when you've got a protected area, you can permit, um, you can regulate, sorry, all activity in the MPA. So you had to pay to have a dive permit to dive, for example, in the MPA. And that's just a way to make money um, for conservation. It's really easy, it wasn't expensive, but if you wanted to dive, you had to buy a permit. And it's a kind of good way to firstly engage people in the oceans, but also to kind of raise money and raise protection. And it creates jobs and livelihoods as well within conservation. So I think MPAs in general are great. And these no take ones, as well as having some take ones, are really valuable. And I think without no take MPAs, I struggle to see a kind of truly sustainable future mm. because I do think there needs to be some areas of the ocean that are off limits. Currently, only 1% of the ocean is fully protected globally. Um, wow, which that's is shocking given the extent of the oceans cover the planet. I mean, if you pardon the pun, but it really is a drop in the ocean, isn't it? Oh, you've been oh, sitting on that for a while. Oh, oh. That's awful. I know. I'm, I'm so proud. Um, so I do think there needs to be more. Um, and again, as we said, I don't think it can be a solution on its own. But I also don't think we can say we have sustainable fishing unless we have some areas of no take within mm. the ocean that mm. actually receive kind of heavy protection as well mm. so kind of moving away from <laughs> whether fishing is sustain sustainable or not we kind of need to talk about um, legislation and eco labeling i think this is going to be the tricky one <laughs> yeah yeah let's let's give it a go <laughs> so the one which is yeah let's talk about eco labels and legislation it's going to be so much fun essentially um the one which i was i was aware of it quite you know a long time before sea spiracy came out but the one which is name checked quite a lot in sea spiracy is the marine stewardship council so that's what i'm going to kind of talk a little bit about so 
The MSC is an independent non-profit organisation which sets a standard for sustainable fishing, as it currently is in its current form, sustainable fishing. And so fisher fisheries that want to demonstrate that they're well managed and sustainable, uh, you know, compare themselves to this MSC standard and they are assessed by a team of independent experts, independent from both MSC and the fishery. And if they do meet these standards of sustainability, their products can be displayed with a blue MSC eco label. Um, and actually, this uh, kind of scheme was founded in response to the Grand Bank's cod fishery collapse. This is very famous cod fishery of, I think it's Massachusetts or Philadelphia in the US, uh, which completely collapsed due to overexploitation. So the concept is, you know, why why would a consumer pick this? So the concept is when a buyer chooses an MSC eco label product, the well managed fisheries are rewarded for their sustainable practices because they are the ones that get involved. And in turn, the market for certified sustainable seafood grows, generating financial incentive to non sustainable fisheries to go sustainable. So it's a really nice way of harnessing market forces to incentivize positive environmental change. And you know, while we kind of, I kind of hate that we have to bring money into it to value something, I actually think it's really important because we live in the society we live in. Capitalism is a very important part of that society, whether you like it or not. So we need to be able to harness that in order to promote conservation. Um, and so, you know, there is, again, there is, there is money involved. So fisheries that want this certification on top of meeting the standards have to pay $20,000 for the assessment. Wow. Um, they res yeah, it's a, it's a lot of money. Yeah. I think um, that's quite problematic, actually. Because well, it's interesting. Yeah. They I think... might, well, yeah, we'll we'll come to yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll come to that. We'll, we'll, yeah. Um, basically, they're recertified every five years. Um, they're scored on a, on on eighty on eighty criteria across three metrics. Um, there's annual surveillance checks to make sure they continue to meet the standard. So, can I just you ask? Know, I is think that... it is a good idea. Is that Sorry, twenty grand a one-off payment, or do they pay that every five years? Pay it every five years. Oh, okay. Well, it's a lot okay. of money then. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, most of that is government subsidy money. Most of that isn't profit from the fishery. Um, right. But you know, I think it's a good idea. We we all you know, as conservationists, we're always telling people people to be conscientious consumers. You know, plastic straws and whatnot. Even you know, yada yada yada. So. Uh, and I like the way it works with the market. Mm, you know, I agree. they put they did this with whales recently. Um, this economist, it was an economist. This is the thing: it's an economist, not a scientist, who figured this out. He said, "Okay, how much a whale's worth?" And he looked at how much carbon a single whale over a lifespan of sixty years would sequester. Obviously, you know, taking the carbon from the circus, pooing in the depths, yada yada yada. And he looked, he looked at that, and then he compared that to the market value of carbon dioxide, carbon as it is now, and he could generate a value for the whale over its lifetime, and it was two million dollars per wow. whale. Wow. So we, now we have a value. Now, now every time a whale dies, we can say, right, we've lost two million dollars, and it's a lot easier to conserve wow. when we say yeah. we're losing money as opposed to lives. So, I think I it's, we're a bit odds, all three of us, we've talked about this before, the idea that you have to monetize wildlife mm. and biomes and ecosystems for people to actually care about it. But mm. like you said, Roby, we do live in a capitalistic society, so kind of mm. maybe we need that. Yeah. We live in a society. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite interesting that you have to pay so much money because I think that would be quite off-putting. I, mm. I, I, I think without that, I think that even gives more reason that the market consumer drive is even more important because that's going to be a reason not you know you're going to think i don't want to pay twenty thousand pounds i'm not going to do it but if it means your fish mm. won't get won't be bought you yeah. would do it but i know in the in the wine industry for example if you want to get an organic label you have to pay for that and i think certain wineries that are operating they're fully they're working fully to the expectations and standards to get that organic label they just don't want to pay for it yeah. So they just, you know, and because there's not this demand from the market of I'm only going to buy organic wine or I'm only going to buy wine that's been assessed, they don't need to. So I think the the drive is really important in order to incentivize these fisheries to make a change. 
it's probably easier for fisheries to spend that money because as i said i think it's mainly subsidy yeah. money they're not yeah. spending their own money they're spending the money that government is doling out to them and 20 grand um, sounds like a lot to me but yeah it might not be that much <laughs> i was gonna say if it's this billion fishing. dollar fishing <laughs> fleet industry they can probably afford it yeah, <laughs> yeah they yeah. probably can but the fact that you have to, to pay yeah. it, i mean it, it is still a cost that they'd have to factor in and so if they're not going to see a return on that cost why would they bother exactly yes presumably if they're willing to spend 20 grand that mm. means that the money that people buy people spend when they buy sustainable certified is 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 gonna cover that um so, so you know i i firmly believe it's a nice idea i think is it theory, working yeah <laughs> Well, I think Sea Spiracy did a very good job of completely and utterly butchering MSC and saying... They did, yeah. So they I did. I think it's good that we mentioned some of the points that they brought up as, like, yeah. why there are big issues with it. Um, and so I think what Sea Spiracy did was it created this huge mistrust in the labels. So I came away from, from it being like, I don't know if I can ever buy it. I don't eat fish, but, like, if I did, I was like, I don't know if I could ever buy a, an MSC label again because I don't know whether mm. to trust it. Um, mm. because basically what they're saying is that there was loads of allegations of corruption kind of relating to these outside inspectors that come in. So suggestions of bribery um, and even people saying that these inspections don't actually happen that often. So this whole idea that you having these external parties come in might not even be happening. Um, and so this was kind of confirmed for dolphin safe tuna. So this is yet another, another label that we have on, on seafood. And they kind of, this was the, the owner, or at least he was very, very heavily involved in the, the dolphin safe tuna label. And he basically said their company cannot guarantee that any one can of tuna is dolphin safe. So it kind of makes the point that these labels are untrustworthy and kind of pointless if you like you're buying the tuna because you you know it does it's dolphin safe and it hasn't contributed to the death of dolphins but he was like yeah we can't guarantee that which um, i found really interesting because i think that's an important point about more about the legislation than the labels because i think we as consumers th- always think you you cannot false advertise it is you know it's illegal or you cannot say on your tuna that it's dolphin safe if it's not it just would not be allowed but clearly it is allowed. And there's obviously... All these Surprise! Kind of, yeah. Because I just... I, it sounds so naive now saying it out loud. But you just kind of think, well, they can't mm. tell me. They can't say that if it's not true. So it's obviously true. They couldn't claim to be dolphin you, safe if they're not dolphin safe. There is a certain rebuttal of that. So the point that I think was made in, in this documentary is that if you if you can't... And I think it was actually talking to this, this, this guy from Dolphin Safe Tuna. Um, and they said, well, if you can't guarantee a universal standard, there's there's no point to your eco-label, which I actually disagree with. There are mm. <laughs> most industries you can think of, you can name them the top of your head, you can't have a universal standard for because they're so big, they're so varied, there's so many different practices on. But we as the consumer can be discriminatory with what we eat and what we choose to spend our money on. So Eve, I completely agree that the mistrust in the label is an issue and I completely agree that it's wrong for to, to market as dolphin safe when it's not but I do take issue with the fact that just because there isn't a universal standard doesn't mean there's any worth with that at all if that I don't know if I articulated yeah, that the best no, way that that does make sense I do understand and I think it is an unrealistic and unfair expectation for us to expect them to say that every single can I guess what you'd hope for is that what they would have said is we can guarantee that 80% or even 60% of the time yeah. it's accurate. Whereas what came across in the documentary, which is, you know, not necessarily 100% factually accurate, was that, you know, the, there's often this bribery going on. There's often it's, you know, corrupt. And so, you know, it just sort of felt like barely any of the cans were actually, yeah. <laughs> or, or yeah. at least they had no idea. They could all be dolphin safe. They just seemed to not have a clue. Yeah. And yeah. so, and it's hard I to think, tell if that's misrepresentation yeah. or not. Yeah, because I agree with you. I think as much as I kind of naively thought, well, how can they say that? I don't. Th- I think it is unfair to expect them to guarantee every single can they've ever produced. But I'd like them to say at least they have a ballpark idea that mm. the majority of the time it is. So that's why we continue to say it's fine. 
But I think it kind of highlights, I think, that there's more a problem with the industry rather than the people who are trying to move towards something more sustainable. Because say if we talk about bycatch, um, they were MSC were hugely criticised for the high levels of bycatch that they had. So that's non-target species that you don't intend to catch. But whilst they're still using those standard fishing practices and fishing nets unless that changes i don't see that we're going even if you were aiming to be the most sustainable fishery ever if you're still using those huge nets that are targeting everything i don't think that's a fault on you that's a fault on the big system Mm. not not changing i thought that was really interesting because i think with bycatch the kind of loophole to get around it is to say well the the fish are sustainable because yeah i don't know for example we're only catching a certain number from a certain area and they're abundant in this area so the fish are sustainable but if the method isn't sustainable then it's not sustainable (laughs) yeah so i I I completely agree that was the kind of bycatch issue that didn't really add up Mm. But I think kind of a point to address is that maybe contrary to what they were saying in Seaspiracy is that the certification process, like we've kind of outlined, it's it's not hugely easy to get certified. Mm. And so some fisheries will spend many years improving their practices to try and reach that standard. And I think that should be rewarded by consumer choices. Um, Mm. I think I think you're right, Emma. I think that is important, this kind of showing over time. And MSC has kind of said as well that any fishery looking to get certified must provide evidence that they are limiting their bycatch as well but they did issue a response directly to seaspiracy and in their response they said that so seaspiracy mentions this one particular icelandic fishery and they believe that this falls into this category of one that's been continually assessed and needs to improve so they said we believe the icelandic fishery mentioned in seaspiracy falls into this latter category It was suspected from the program because it was suspended from the program, sorry, because of bycatch issues and only allowed back into the program when those issues had been resolved. Which sounds great, but I really didn't like how in their kind of published response they said we believe this Icelandic fishery falls into this category because surely surely that's something you know or you should know. know. And it didn't make sense because they said, Oh, we believe this to be the case and then they pulled out specific information about this fishery saying it's been suspended. And it will be allowed back. And I said, well, you know that, but you don't know whether that is, you don't even know what fishery they were talking about. And I just think it, the overall response of the MSC to Sea Spishery, to Sea Spiracy, mm. I thought was very coherent and is definitely worth a read. And they defend themselves quite well, I think. But I mean, so I guess just they- to point there, if someone hasn't watched the documentary, the whole, the point was that um seaspiracy were trying to interview msc to get an answer and they refused to do it for the documentary but post documentary they wrote a big document in response yeah. to all the things that they wanted to say yeah no thank you for that clarification which is kind of fair enough i feel um, yes i given I'm the 100%. style of of some of the interviews um yeah, also definitely. if you turn up in, on my front door with a camera i'm going to shut it in your face yeah, exactly. I think they knew they were going to be portrayed as the bad guys and they knew they wouldn't have any control over the Yeah, so they wanted narrative. to control. So, yeah. Yeah, but I just think when drafting a response, you would make sure that every single word is true and surely you keep mm. detailed records on all your fisheries that you work with. Mm. And so it would be really simple to check this Icelandic fishery and see if it does fall into this category or not. And it just suggests to me that the MSC doesn't really care that much about the claims made by the documentary. And it kind of thinks maybe the fuss will just die down. And so they've issued this statement as a kind of, oh, look, we're really interested. Fish are sustainable. I hope that's not the case. And the rest of the response does seem quite careful and detailed. So I'm not really sure why they let this slip through, but it just sort of felt a bit washy and a bit... Yeah. You know, a bit vague a in bit a bit of a vague, weird way well there was no need to be vague and yeah and also that's they, their chance of it's on paper they're not yeah. under pressure they're not on live camera like you can be really picky okay, about your they, wording exactly and it's not that they were you know they weren't on trial they didn't have to come out and defend themselves rigorously but i just think you know you've you've got the receipts use them i don't understand how they could not yeah. have a clue or, do, they or does that mean they don't have the receipts that this icelandic fishery they're talking about is being re-reviewed. Yeah. Which, I mean... 
I think it just sort of undermined their whole point because I think the fact that they're saying you can be suspended and allowed back with improvement is really valuable. Um, so the fact they don't know that was a bit like, well, yeah. that, well that was a really good defence. You should have made that solid. Um, but they do provide examples um, of certified fisheries which have made these improvements, um, particularly with limiting bycatch. Um, so a fishery of rock lobster in Australia reduced its bycatch of sea lions and hake, um, and a hake fishery in South Africa reduced its bycatch of albatross by 99%. And that is incredibly impressive. So they, they have these stats and this evidence. I don't know why they used <laughs> such vague language. It just really irked me, but... <laughs> It's fine. Um, I You'd do make think a good lawyer, Kate. If you've, <laughs> if you've watched Seaspiracy, then I definitely recommend th- following it up by reading this response. It's very, it's not very long. Yeah, um, it's just on their website, but it is a, it's very interesting, and you do want a balanced argument. That's you know a lot to unpack. It has been very challenging for us uh, <laughs> trying to put this podcast together. So perhaps now is a good time to look at. Maybe alternatives to f- fish, uh, alternatives to sustainable fishing and sustainable farming as a whole. Maybe we get rid of all this. What other options are there? Do we think? I mean, I think we do have to address kind of the changing consumption aspect, which was the co- whole kind of pitch of sea spiracy. Um, because I honestly, I don't think we can continue exploiting fish stocks in the way that we are. Um, because if not, we face all fisheries collapsing and we will have driven so many fish species and other marine wildlife to extinction in the process. So I think like we've already said, it's clear to, um, like we just want to make it clear that when we're talking about people kind of making a change in the amount of seafood that they consume, we're kind of talking about people that are privileged enough to make choices about the food that they're eating. So we're not mm. talking about communities that rely on subsistence fishing for their survival because that that's very different. So I think if you have the privilege and kind of the means to reduce the amount of seafood in your diet um, or to even cut it out completely if, if that's the choice you want to make, I think that's honestly one of the best things you can do. To, to kind of help our oceans. I think Seaspiracy does have a point there. Um, they just maybe blanketed it too much to covering the whole whole world population. Um, but I think a point I wanted to make is that making a big dietary change like that is a different process for everyone. So kind of some people could just cut out fish overnight, never look back. Others need more time. Some people need to research it. And I think we need to respect that some people might just be taking the time right now to to educate themselves and they might not be able to make a change from one day to the next and I don't think we can expect that. So just like as a personal example, I grew up eating meat. I didn't turn veggie until I was about 14, 15 and it took several years after that for me to transition to a plant-based diet. And I was only able to make those choices once I had educated myself kind of about the extent of the problems that I see with the, the meat, dairy and fishing industries. So I think we need to respect that, that people might take time, but that any impact, like any changes you can make do, do have a big impact. Um, yeah, I think so, that's, that's a really lovely point to make because I've, I've never really thought about that. I was exactly the same. It was such a long process for me. And me it's, too. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's still ongoing. You know, I, I have a plant-based diet, but I'm still learning and I'm still adapting and still making improvements. So I I think, yeah, that's a really lovely point. Another, and just like while we're talking about diet and consumption, another kind of change you can make that's a little bit less extreme than just cutting out all seafood tomorrow is looking at what species we're eating and actually eating further down the food chain. So things like oyster or um, oysters offer a healthy product, low in fat, high in omega-3. And shellfish farms actually clean the water of uh, excess nutrients. So we kind of should be, or we you know could invest strongly in the creation of larger shellfish farming industry and either involve the restoration of overexploited offshore mussel or oyster banks, um, or perhaps placed at the mouths of large river estuaries to filter out runoff from the land or in an aquaponic system, as we mentioned. And we should also shift away from these kind of schooling, high trophic level species such as tuna and instead focus on more kind of sustainable species, for instance, carp, and just develop a kind of 
domestic market for polyculture grazed carp um because you know what better use is there for all the agricultural waste in britain than to fuel the grazing of farmed carp because that's more food for i'm all for it yeah and also not agricultural (laughs) i like that idea i'm all for uh, it (laughs) something that came out about using sewage waste yeah yeah um so just looking at what species you're eating is kind of another step you can take that's that kind of can help our oceans bouncing off that we get told quite a lot that you know we're going to be left with an ocean full of squid and jellyfish because we've got these absence of large predators which we've all killed and so you're getting it is a classic example of mesa predator release and overabundance and so you know because the sharks are gone suddenly there's nothing to eat the squid so the squid are going boom and all the little fish are getting eaten by the squid because squid eat everything Mm. so one option i'd really like to see and this is largely in you know nations which have the economic and developed privilege to be able to switch their diet with relatively few ill effects i'd like to see you know whether we can shift our fisheries to target fish species because that then fishermen get to keep their income Mm. and their livelihoods and pressure is eased on commercial fish species both because the fishermen aren't eating them and there aren't as many squid to eat them so kind of everyone wins and it buys us time you know to get the sharks back is what, I, what I, you know we really need. So I, I really mm. like this idea of actually eating lower down the food chain yeah. and changing to what is locally overabundant. You know, go even further down the fish uh, down the fish chain, even further down the food chain. Um, <laughs> seaweed and kelp could be really, really strong industries yeah. to invest in. We know. It's and a five, really nutritious. Yeah, it's a five billion dollar industry in Asia. We can get all the omega three we need from it. Oh. Um, it's a it's a nutritious food product with no arable land, no fresh water, no fertilizer, no pesticides. You could do it off the coast of Britain, where we used to have massive kelp forests before we destroyed them all. So you know, those are I think three other solutions which might which well I think do have a place in how we make our harvesting of the oceans more sustainable. Um, They're kind of separate from whether or not we do or don't eat fish. Um, But, you know, I think it is important to point out there are other alternatives. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, Seaspiracy. We had to redo our entire uh, podcast episode in light of what they said. Do we want to maybe just, like, talk a little bit about what we thought they did quite well? Yeah, I think that'd be good because I think it's obviously people came away from it thinking different things. I mean, almost mm. everyone I've spoke to has had a different opinion <laughs> about Seaspiracy. Mm. Um, I think what I what it did really well um, is kind of just tackle this topic of the ignorance that we have about what's going on in our oceans. So it kind of exposed the atrocities of the fishing industry on a mass scale, which I don't know if other documentaries have had the same effect before. And I think it kind of left you feeling that individual action can make a difference when it comes to tackling this problem through through dietary changes. And I think just getting people to question where their seafood co- is coming from is a great first step. Like asking where your food is coming from is really good. And I thought it was interesting that it brought up the topic of slavery in the fishing industry. Yeah, I thought it was interesting kind of how it highlighted that it was it wasn't just a, it's not just an environmental issue but it's a human rights one too so I think to be honest this documentary was a massive wake-up call for so many people and that's what we need we need people to be aware and actually care about the state of our oceans if we're going to address the ocean crisis so that's kind of what I took away that I thought it did well um Roby what, what what did you think um, I think, I think on balance, um, Seaspiracy probably did more things uh, poorly than it did well. For the purposes of this particular segment, I really appreciated the connections that this film made um, in a way that, as you said, Emma, I don't, even stuff like, you know, Blue Planet or, you know, the high quality Attenborough ones, I don't think they've done as well. They highlighted how all these issues are interlinked. And no one is in isolation. And I think this film was perhaps the best example that I've ever seen of demonstrating this interconnection. Sometimes they were reaching and, you know, it did feel a little staged. But I actually thought that ability to link those issues was really valuable. And I really appreciated how 
kind of yeah how how they how they did that because I've not seen that to that extent before. Yeah, I I agree with both of you. I think um, I think what the documentary did a great job in doing is just starting a conversation about how we treat our oceans and particularly about some of the kind of darker sides of the fishing industry. So like you said, Emma, enlightening people on modern day slavery operating as part of industrial fishing is incredibly important and education Mm. is the first step in stamping out some of these issues. I also think we do need to take the time to talk about fishing and for me, the kind of biggest difference between the meat industry and the fish industry is at least in most kind of Western cultures, fish are wild animals, whereas we don't tend to eat terrestrial wild animals. So obviously there's a a conservation issue related to large scale fishing, which isn't the same in terms of agriculture. Obviously agriculture is highly environmentally flawed and we all know that. And in terms of climate change, it's, you know, you know, almost enemy number one, but in terms of conservation, this idea that we're just harvesting wild animals on this unprecedented scale is, it's a big thing and I think we often and I definitely thought this for a long time thought fish was better than meat and if you're going to give up something give up meat Mm -hmm. and I think this brought and whether that's true or not I think Seaspiracy did a good job in saying actually we need to think about fish more and I think it's obviously important to discuss the impacts of these industries on the environment climate change as well as just marine ecosystems so I think at the very least Seaspiracy ignited a conversation that we need to have um, and I hope that the kind of criticisms of the documentary don't overshadow that because fundamentally the point they were making is our oceans are in trouble and the fishing industry has a lot to be held accountable for. And so I think that they did that very well. But, you know, I agree it wasn't perfect. <laughs> In this next part, we're going to discuss other things that we feel should be given airtime, kind of about the issues of marine conservation and the seafood the sustainable seafood industry kind of in general so we're not going to criticize seaspiracy because that's not really our purpose i kind of think you can take from it what you want um but what we do want to discuss is some of the issues that we feel weren't presented in this documentary um kind of to better flesh out this issue and provide more depth to the discussion um so insert some nuance into this topic, I think, because that's what it needs. Mm. So, Kate, do you, do you want to start? Maybe just we're expanding this idea a bit. Yeah, I think the first thing we wanted to say was that the problems that our ocean face, and particularly with regards to the seafood issue, are not caused equally by all people on the planet. Now, obviously, we've mentioned subsistence fishing, but we're just not all equally at fault. And the kind of massive industrial fishing fleets of China, the EU and the USA, to name a few, are having a much greater impact than subsistence fisheries. Appropriately, different methods of fishing or of fish farming also have different impacts. It's important we recognise this fact because our efforts to tackle these issues should be accordingly discriminatory. We should focus on the big problems not the smaller issues that serve as scapegoats for other issues. So large trawling fleets are infinitely more culpable than individual fishermen. (laughs) And, you know, even saying that seems ridiculous to put them in the same sentence. And I think this has also been documented with the plastic issue, that it sort of became the biggest environmental issue in the world and climate change took a bit of a backseat. And I think, again, we have to just recognise that the scale of these issues do vary and in terms of responsibility that blame is not equally shared and i think bouncing quite nicely on from that in that theme of inequality the consequences will not be borne equally by all the people on the planet and we saw this very well illustrated in seaspiracy where this eu fishing fleet operating off the coast of west africa was contributing to food insecurity on the west West african landmass by outcompeting them for fishing resources and what i what really became apparent to me when watching that is that developed nations will always have the consumer power and the capital to simply outsource their problems and outsource their demands overseas once their own fish stocks have been used up whereas west african countries as this you know to use this example don't have the capacity to do this and are at far greater risk of of food insecurity and so therefore you know the developed nations who are most to blame for the state of the oceans 
have the greatest capacity to adapt to the collapsing fish stocks, either by switching to artificial protein or seaweed or whatever. Mm. But for communities which solely rely on subsistence fisheries, their capacity is so much more reduced. So uh, that really kind of came to me as a result of this doc documentary. We're not going to all be affected equally in the same way we're not all at fault. And I think mm. that also needs to be discussed as well. Yeah, and I think kind of leading on from that, it's not only that we're not going to be affected equally, but I think we have different choices to make depending on our circumstances. Mm. So in developed nations, which operate kind of industrial fishing fleets, the choices are clear. Kind of there must be a strong dietary switch to reduce consumption of wild caught fish and a strong investment in sustainable alternatives as well. Um, so things like making fish farming more sustainable, like we talked about. Um, and I think we've kind of agreed that <laughs> all fishing subsidies kind of need to be ended immediately or, or severely reformed. Um, and kind of that no take marine protected areas must be widely implemented. They've shown to be successful. Um, and also just the price of wild caught fish must be raised in order to help um, reduce demand. Kind of, I think it's that consumer power thing as well. It's, it's very, very powerful. Um, and like we said, there needs to be investment in sustainable alternatives. I don't think just a boycott of fishing mm. is the answer. There needs mm. to be a push towards sustainable alternatives. And once these measures have been taken, um, it may turn out that sustainable small scale fishing is then possible. So in particular, individual people in developed countries, I think have the responsibility to shrink the size and the nature of the seafood industry by reducing and changing their consumption and also being selective of the products they, they buy as well. Uh, yeah, so I think it's important to kind of note that the nations and people who um, are at most fault should do the most to change and the same goes for climate change as well i think <laughs> um so i think it's unfair and exploitative to ask the people least at fault here to to change in order to solve the problem so simply saying we should all stop eating fish i don't think is particularly helpful practical or actually useful um so in less developed nations where there's a strong reliance on the seafood sector the choices are, are different so i think there there kind of has to be a, a conservation of coral ecosystems creation of no-take mpas and election of political parties who prioritize reform of kind of the agriculture and energy sectors to more sustainable sources so i think the choices to make as a developed or a developing nation are very different and seaspiracy I don't think discriminated enough between the two. Yeah, I think, you know, these are complex issues and they require complex solutions. You know, fisheries are evidently not perfect, but there are an awful lot of dedicated scientists and researchers who have been working for a long time to make them better. And we know that seafood is a source of nutrition for 3.3 billion people. So it is clearly, we clearly need a kind of a compound issue here. The other thing I think also would, which would benefit, um, which would benefit marine conservation and which I think should probably be talked about, I think there needs to be a change in our style of discourse and our style of, you know, our tone. Um, a nice example of this, which I thought, you know, and did some more research on, which came up in, in this documentary, was Sea Shepherd. So Sea Shepherd have a kind of a one size fits all policy when it comes to action. And this works really well with the Vaquita. If you listen to our Vaquita episode, they were able to be nimble enough to come in here and do the essential work. And they're one of the only reasons there are any Vaquita left at all. It's failing quite badly with Japanese whaling. So there's quite a lot of convincing evidence to say that actually, before Sea Shepherd started their activities, the Japanese public was largely apathetic towards state whaling and didn't really have an interest in it. Then when Sea Shepherd got involved and became very aggressive, the Japanese state could present them as this very aggressive, very neo-colonialist, pseudo-extremist, anti-whaling organisation. And that really allowed them to whip up public support among the Japanese people, therefore making it much harder to actually halt Japanese whaling. And 
if you you know if you think about it japan is a sovereign yeah. state there is no way they will ever cave to a load of white people turning up on a boat and shouting at them especially considering you know the historical and socio-political context there so That's i think really interesting it That's won't really interesting. it won't work and i think we need to be similarly flexible in how we discuss issues like this you know mm. sometimes confrontation is good sometimes persuasion is better i think yeah that's a really good point. Well done. Yeah, no, I... I <laughs> I'm like, wow. Thanks. <laughs> no, I think that that's a really, really good point to make. And I think despite all of this, like we've talked about some of the pros, some of the things that maybe could have been expanded a bit more, I would still recommend watching it. Um, I don't, would you guys agree? Would you say you would recommend for people to watch it? I, I would, yeah. I probably I would. would. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but I've got a caveat it. to that, like to yeah. say that don't just watch it and take everything to be Face just value. fact but mm. i don't think mm. you should with anything um mm. i would kind of take it as a springboard so there are some other really really good documentaries and scientific journals papers on the topic um so just to recommend a couple of other documentaries if you want more on this 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 issue so there's one called mission blue um there's chasing coral a plastic ocean the cove ghost fleet and the end of the line and that's just to name a few nice um, titles i like the puns <laughs> yeah I, I like them but they're just some other ones if, if you if you want to explore it a little bit more um yeah so i guess thank you for sticking with us <laughs> in this very <laughs> lengthy podcast but i guess we could end by just saying like do we think there is such a thing as a sustainable fish Ooh. what do we think <laughs> here we go wow. kate do you want to go first Okay. Throwing you under the bus there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Do I think you can go into a supermarket and buy a fish and be confident that it's sustainable? No, I don't. But I do think sustainable fishing is possible. Obviously, we know subsistence fishing is sustainable. Catching your own fish is sustainable. Although, I do think given current levels of commercial fishing, if you do not need to catch your own food then doing so just means more fish die. And so again, it comes back to that. People in different areas need different solutions. I definitely do, I, I do feel some mistrust towards these certifications of sustainability within the fishing industry. And I believe industrial fishing is the kind of biggest threat to our oceans, possibly second to climate change. Um, and we do desperately need to protect our oceans, um, if for nothing else, as an ally for climate change, but also for the incredible biodiversity housed there. But I do think it is possible to sustainably harvest fish. I just don't think it's happening right now. Um, but we do, I think we've outlined a lot of possible ways for it to happen in the future or for it to expand to happen more um, through kind of aquaponics and obviously no take MPAs. Um, we stand. <laughs> you no take MPAs. No take MPAs, don't you, Kate? Um, <laughs> we should get that on a t shirt. We stand with yeah. no take MPAs. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just think right now we're not we're not succeeding so yeah. kind of overall i think sustainable fishing is possible in theory um and it should be in practice but just at the moment i'm hesitant to i'm hesitant to say that there is such thing as a sustainable fish that i could just go out and buy mm. what about you roby what do you think <laughs> well you know i i i i broadly sit on the same bus as you i think you know Yay. is current is you know is current industrial fishing sustainable absolutely not do I therefore think that, you know, just going into supermarket and getting a fish is sustainable? No, I don't think so. I don't think fish farming is sustainable either at the moment. I do think, as as you say, I do think it could be. Um, sustainable fish farming, I think, is, 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 a, is a very exciting new field, which we want to get hear more of. Aquaponics and polyculture. Some current methods of wild fishing are sustainable. Rod fishing, literally kayaking out. Bloop fish Mm. flap 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 you know that's totally Mm. fine um so you know what maybe i'll just say what i am going to do actually as a result of this whole few weeks of fish madness (laughs) so my methods to be as sustainable as possible with my seafood i am going to massively cut down on the amount of seafood that i eat i will no longer buy from supermarkets i will only ever if i'm going to have fish either eat a fish that i have caught myself I don't live by the coast, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> so I'm going to buy direct from a fisherman. Um, 
If it's farmed fish, I will only buy if it comes from a deep water farm or a hydroponics aquaponics system. Again, I doubt that's going to happen, so I'm just going to go out and say I'm not going to get farmed fish. In terms of my, my, my lifestyle choices, I'm going to make choices that kind of expect retailers and ask retailers to supply only traceable seafood. If I do eat seafood, I'm going to eat lower down the sea, lower down the food chain, try marine plants, all that weird algae stuff. Loads of algae in the ocean. We don't know nearly enough about it. Um, only eating under under utilized species that are locally abundant um, and demanding the government end subsidies is what I'm going to do. So that's where I sit on it. I don't think it's sustainable, but I am going to make choices to try and make my consumption as small as possible and also as sustainable as possible. Can I just say quickly? I, I think, think one that's, of the things uh, uh, any, anyone could. No, you go. Sorry. No, go ahead, Kate. One of the things you said that I really like in the asking resellers to supply traceable food, and I think if you are someone who wants to maybe phase out fish or wants to continue eat, eating fish and follow these more sustainable steps that Roby just outlined, where you very occasionally eat fish, etc., asking where your fish came from is really important, whether you're in a restaurant, in a supermarket, ask where it's from, ask where it was caught, and ask how it was caught. Because there's sort of three levels to a sustainable wild fish. There's the species, the method, and the, the kind of transportation to get it to you. Um, and I think those, making sure you're asking these questions, because if we ask enough, they're going to eventually start changing it because they're going to realise, oh, they don't buy them if they've been caught in a trawler. Huh, mm. maybe we should stop buying trawlered <laughs> fish. <laughs> so I think that's, a, if you do want to continue eating seafood, definitely... That all those things Roby said are really good but definitely just ask as many questions as you can from the people you're buying from and ask wasters in restaurants because honestly it's just quite funny um I had <laughs> friends in South Africa do it and they would be so confused and they'd go into the kitchens and come back with all this information for us and but if more and more people do that they will look at their who they're buying from what about you Emma one final one final question can there be a sustainable fish? No, sorry. Is there a sustainable fish, do you think? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think kind of agree with what both of you have said. I haven't got much more to add to that in the sense that I think that given the current rates of exploitation and the current ways that we're fishing, I don't think you can have a sustainable fish. But like we've outlined, like you were saying with kind of the aquaponics, the polyculture systems, I think they're kind of the way forward and it's the scale at which we're fishing is the problem i don't have a problem with fishing i mean there's billions of people on the planet who depend on it for livelihoods and, and their primary protein source um so i just think we need to change this attitude of take as much as you can now and we'll mm. worry about the consequences later yeah. because that tends to be a very human a dominated <laughs> attitude to yeah. a lot of our problems on the planet um but I think to just say there's no such thing as a sustainable future in fishing is wrong. Mm. I think that we should be aiming for more sustainable practices. We're not there yet, but <laughs> I don't think we should just rule out fishing completely because we've kind of coexisted alongside the oceans since the origin of our species. So it's kind of, mm. I think we need to regain that collaboration with the oceans rather than let's decimate them all. <laughs> so thank you very much everyone for sticking yeah. with us through this tangled tangled kelp <laughs> forest of <laughs> sustainable seafood and sustainable fishing i am now gonna go and have chips is what i'm yeah. gonna do not fish just chips <laughs> <laughs> so we hope you've all enjoyed it as ever please do get involved we want to know what you think comment like and subscribe and we really want to know what you think about both about Seaspiracy and also about, you know, more importantly, really, what your thoughts are on sustainable fishing. Um, let us know down below. You can follow us all on social media. All of our links will be in the comment below. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Um, all the links will be below. And if you want to check us out, uh, we also do some very interesting stuff on our Instagrams with wildlife filmmaking and British wildlife. Um, so we are at Emma Hodson Wildlife on Instagram, at conservation underscore Kate on Instagram, and at Roby Watkinson on Instagram. So we will see you next time. Bye. 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 <laughs>